absolutely. Absolutely. Glad, glad to be here. I, uh, you know, I feel like I'm making regular occurrences coming back to startup week uh, to, to make some of these, these talks and uh, it's always fun. I, I've always enjoyed it. Um, and uh, you know, thank you for the introduction, Dave. I certainly appreciate that. Uh, it's, it's always nice to, to see that and see kind of where uh, some of us go after we graduate. And certainly as he mentioned, we had one degree, IST. Um, but funnily enough, that's not where I started. When I came to Penn State, I was actually in aerospace first. And then you get into all the fun, funny math, as I like to call it. And it was like, yeah, that's enough of that for me. And then landed in IST. But, you know, since graduating, you can see I've jumped a little bit uh, around uh, to, before making my way back to, to Booz Allen. But it's always been in cybersecurity uh, and it's always been, you know, in both deep and technical realm, you know, working at PwC where I was doing pen testing, um, you know, breaking things for clients, doing a little bit of forensics work there to what I call my first stint or first tour of duty at Booz Allen, where I switched teams and went to help design, build and run security operations centers for some government agencies, most notably a uh, large federal um Law enforcement agency is the way I could categorize it and not get myself in trouble. Lots of fun things, but you kind of switch the skill sets there and then took a short hiatus between Stainset, Booz Allen, and went to Gartner for nine years, where I did a lot of security consulting uh, as a time of it, you know, as part of my time there before making it all the way back to, to Booz Allen, where, you know, as you mentioned, I'm a vice president there. I run our whole cyber security strategy, program design, cyber risk elements um, as part of a broader suite of things, which includes incident response, which I know that's what this class is all about, digital forensics, which is a big part of it. Uh, you know, so we do quite a lot of work there and work with extensively with commercial clients. So, you know, I do have time uh, in this built for Q&A, but I'm going to had one quick thing off at the pass because I always get the question every time I come back and it's just easier to do it now. It's always the, well, what kind of fun car do you have? Uh, it's always the one I get and I have a fun picture of it. So that's a Mustang Boss 302. Uh, it uh, lives in the garage most of the time, uh, but uh, it's a fun car to drive. A uh, nice, nice little collector car. But like you said, wanted to get that little, uh, little conversation piece out of the way before we get that question at the end, because it's, it's always a fun one, but I love, I love doing it. And that's my baby. <laughs> so what are we going to talk about a little bit today? Uh, you know, uh, when we talk about crypto and you have to kind of backtrack a little bit to understand what crypto is and not, not knowing the full suite of curricula here uh, across all the majors. I like to start a little bit at the beginning and uh, you know, we'll certainly Tell me if you guys know a lot of this and we'll we'll speed up a little bit in some of these parts and if not. But, you know, I want to start around blockchain because it's an important component and then talk about what is cryptocurrency really uh, at the end of the day. And then, you know, kind of bring it home with how does it matter as it pertains to cybersecurity? And there's a couple different angles that I want to get into as we talk about that today. But certainly feel free if there are questions that come up. I uh I present to people all the time. I love questions. I don't like talking at folks. So feel free to raise your hand and ask a question. I love them. Um, and if for any of those folks that are, well, I guess we probably can't for the ones that are on Zoom uh, here, but uh, certainly would love uh, some interactivity. And I do have a couple of pieces built in. So let's go ahead and get started. And, you know, it's really important to think, and I'm sure most of you are aware, you know, of a lot of the, we'll call it geopolitics that are happening today. But think about just the shift that's, every, uh, that's happening in the world. I mean, we're moving more and more towards pure digitalization as a part of that. And I guess here's a quick fun poll question. How many of you actually carry hard cash with you every day? Okay, that's actually a pretty good number. Because if I ask this in a, diff in a different context, you know, you get one or two hands. So it, it is interesting to take into consideration, but... You know, when you think about, you know, digital assets, digital currency, which we'll get into, you know, certainly as we talk about here from a, a cryptocurrency standpoint, you know, it's it's just becoming more and more common. Um, you know, people use cards more, uh, you know, the tap to pay makes things so much easier. And really, you know, the, the call it, perceived value of having hard currency is changing, um, never going away. Uh, but it's certainly staying around. So it, it is interesting, you know, when we look at the digital payments perspective, because there comes the rise of cryptocurrency. So before we jump into that and what crypto is, let's talk a little bit about what blockchain is. Does anybody, do you guys, have you covered blockchain at all uh, as part of any of the curricula? 
no no okay that's fine that's fine i took that stance as we came in but it's important before we jump into it to understand what it is and how it relates to crypto as well and then we'll kind of that building on that foundation we'll talk about the, how crypto is used as a, as a bit of that as well so you know for any of you and i guess i already asked this series of questions but you know when you think about blockchain it sounds like a really cool technology and uh, you know i want to kind of walk through just a couple different things you know around that and, and talk through uh, a couple different misconceptions which it doesn't sound like this class has a whole lot of them which is great uh you know it makes this conversation a little bit easier but you know, blockchain and Bitcoin certainly are not the same thing. I'm sure many of you are reading this this slide as we go. Uh, there's a lot of things that are going on, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time getting into the super levels of detail that it takes to do blockchain effectively, but it is meant to basically enable a different way to do transactions. Uh, and you, there's, a, there's a number of things where you think, hey, it's only for making financial transactions easier. That's usually what we hear when, when people talk about blockchain, um, particularly some of my clients that I work with, ones that are not financial institutions. They're like, well, how do we use blockchain? And I'll, I'll talk through a couple examples in just a minute as well. But there are a number of different use cases. Uh, really, it's an endless number of use cases that are possible. But when we think about what blockchain is, my keyboard wants to work here. Apparently not today. <clears throat> Think about how the, the world works today. When you send money to someone, you know, send it from your bank account, pay a bill, you know, pay something, it usually goes through a bank, right? That bank then clears it through a clear, what's called a clearinghouse. There's an intermediary. There's a couple, I call them, they're like non uh, NGOs or non-government offices so you think of there's literally a company called the clearinghouse there's another one when you're trading stocks and such that's called uh, depository trust clearing corporation and that's just to name a couple of them but they act as that middleman to facilitate that transaction and this happens for really any bank transaction whether it's here in the u.s international any of that uh, that happens uh, for that. What's interesting as we as we think about that, and, and it becomes important as we look at blockchain and how it works, is that set of clearing houses, be it whatever company it is, they hold that massive database for all of those transactions. So from an attacker's mindset, well, what if we take that out? Um, or what if we turn that off? Uh, think about just a real world example for you. You, know, you think about what's going on in Russia and Ukraine. They got cut off from a service called Swift, which basically cut out that clearinghouse piece of uh, piece of the puzzle. Meaning they could do no financial transactions as a part of that, uh, as a part of their economy. Um, and it was a way to kind of push back a little bit. But it is one thing to be considerate of as you think towards the digitization component that we touched on before. But you know, it it, it is critical to understand that you know that clearinghouse for how financial institutions work today if it's not there you can't do them you cannot send payments that's why you can't you know banks don't transfer money on saturdays and sundays because they just don't process transactions that way um, because the clearinghouse isn't normally running in that way as well so how is blockchain different it eliminates that middleman instead of having that what they call centralized ledger component now we've kind of put it out and made it distributed and it makes it transparent. It makes it basically, you can't change what's going on there because of the level of encryption that's associated with that. We won't touch on crypto, on quantum computing today. That's a whole nother conversation that you could probably spend a whole class on. And I'm sure there are classes on uh, in the curriculum today, but you know, what it does is basically remove that middleman, make it easier to do transactions and rely on that actual network itself. So when you send money to somebody else, it goes into this rough middle ground where it's not located anywhere else and then goes to person B without having to traverse the banks um, or traverse uh, you know, any, anything else other than that network uh, itself. So, you know, when we think about, you know, finance is always easy, sending money, but how does blockchain help us beyond finance? 
Um, there's a lot of things called like smart contracts, making it harder to kind of get out or go back on it. And they're more verifiable because of the way that blockchain works. And it helps because it's distributing the workload uh, as a part of that. Think of it as like a super massive computer at the end of the day, because it's distributing all of these out. There's pieces everywhere and it's double checking uh, components as, as an element, uh, you know, of, of its actual interactions uh, across that as well. So, you know, th these are, that's just one example. There are a whole host and man, that looks a lot smaller on that screen than it did on mine. Uh, you know, a whole host of different uh, use cases for this. And just to put it into perspective, as we think about blockchain and, and, and the component to it, I know this is an eye chart. You can't read any of it. That's intentional, but it covers every major industry out there, um, and there's just different ways to utilize it. And, and it just it's gonna it is while it's slow from an adoption standpoint, it is changing the way that business is done, the way we have to think about cybersecurity as a perspective on it, and it really creates a lot of opportunities to do a whole host of new things, including cryptocurrency. So. If any of you are aware, the first real bit or first real crypto was Bitcoin. And it was invented, I think it's what, like 13 years ago now, something like that. Um, and it's taken off. It's about, what's the, what's the equivalent? I think the last time I looked, it was like $44,000 of Bitcoin was the, was the equivalent. So it took a massive uh, ride up uh, to that. It is worth uh, billions, I think now. I'm trying to remember because there's, I think that I think that's about right. Yeah, when we look at the total number of bitcoins, because there's a finite number of them, that there's a uh, just a, an innumerable amount of it. But essentially, when we think about what, you know what is crypto, it's just like your hard cash. It's just there is no physical asset to go with it. Uh, ultimately, it's one bitcoin. Think of it. It's almost synonymous like owning a piece of stock. There is a perceived value to it, but there's nothing tangible behind it to supplement that. So God forbid the internet went down, you can't get to any of your money or you lose your password to your wallet, um, which I don't want to get into that topic today. <laughs> you know, as, as many have done for, for their Bitcoin wallets, you can't ever get to it. You can never recover that kind of information. So there are a number of dangers um, around it, but there is a whole host of different kinds of crypto and crypto relies on blockchain. So that method we just went through with how blockchain works, crypto works in that same fashion. So you're essentially building on uh, cryptographic methods. You're doing what's called mining for that to discover the right kinds of pieces. It's a topic I'm not as familiar with in terms of how you actually mine for cryptocurrency, but it is possible. There are companies making a lot of money doing it, but it's really energy intensive uh, now versus when it first started. You could do it on your laptop at home um, and really make a little bit at it. But now it's much, much harder um, and the cost benefit you know, relationship really didn't help. But what's important to think about, and I'll put this into perspective, is it you cannot counterfeit cryptocurrency, period because of the cryptographic methods that are there and that distributed ledger component, meaning you'd have to compromise every single node on that network and then try to counterfeit your piece of um, crypto. And it's just not possible. What's different though, when you think about that from, we'll say the hard currency standpoint, crypto can actually be, or the, the hard currency can be counterfeited and largely is at that point as well. So it's very interesting. Did you? Nice. Yeah, so this, and that's just one of hundreds. Yeah, that's just one. Um, and there, there's a, I think I touch on it here in, in just a minute or two on just some of the different platforms that are out there. I guess here's a fun, quick question. Does anybody in here own any cryptocurrency? Okay. What do you, what do you guys have? Bitcoin? Okay. Okay. I mean, there's just, there's thousands of them. I have a little bit of Shiba and some Dogecoin uh, as well myself. So, you know, just what, just waiting for that nice spike to happen here. <laughs> to, be nice to get a nice meteoric rise uh, or shed a couple zeros would be great. Oh, that's a, that's a fun conversation. Um, 
some of them, yes. Uh, it is interesting as you get into the particulars uh, on how those cryptocurrencies are set up. You know, like Shiba and Dogecoin, there's a finite number of them. So the longer you go being in that market, the less of them are available. So yes, there will be a spike. I mean, right now, I think um, Shiba is at like a couple hundred thousandths of a cent. So, you know, it's more, now we're counting on more shedding zeros till we get to a cent, but you think about, hey, I, I forget how many sheep as I have, a couple, couple million, I think at that point. If it sheds it, then yeah, you, you count on that. Um, so yes, it's possible. Is it going to be a reality anytime soon? That's anybody's guess because crypto is highly volatile. Uh, you know, Bitcoin has gone up and down extensively. Uh, you know, over the past couple of years, uh, and, you know, it can, it can drop in value, you know, 10 grand in a day easily. And that can happen to quite a bit of them. So it, it's just something to, to keep, keep in mind. And, and what's interesting, you know, over the past 13 years, when crypto first came out, it was tax free. Uh, not so much anymore. So if you have crypto, you sell crypto, you got to report it like you do stock trades. There's all that fun, all, all that fun stuff, you know, there's not, not a whole lot of regulation around it yet, but there will be. Uh, it's been definitely debated hotly uh, in in the in Congress quite a lot. So more regulations are coming. It's actually banned in some international countries. Um, but to put it into perspective, you know, as well, just to bring it back into kind of the real world. You know, I mentioned that Russia got cut off from SWIFT as well as a bunch of other stuff. They actually started getting cut out of crypto uh, as well because then normal people were actually trying to use crypto to to basically do their everyday lives because they had no other way to transact stuff. So now, you know, come back to that point again, you know, the, the balancing act that we're playing from a digitized world, um, particularly in the payment scheme as well. So, you know, it, I almost have almost like I planned it perfect lead in there. You know, it is one where it does reduce the risk because now you're not reliant on traditional currency. Like you think about, take the US for instance, uh, in this case, every bit of hard currency is supposedly backed up by gold in the Federal Reserve. Um, it's down in, uh, what is that, Fort Knox. I was trying to remember the name of it. And I say supposedly because, you know, it's very hard to perceive that. But, you know, much like, uh, you know, I mentioned before, counterfeiting certainly undervalues that. Inflation undervalues it. That's a different topic for a different day uh, and probably not in this curriculum. But, you know, as we look at, uh, you know, how useful is crypto in everyday lives, it's just as easy to use as regular cash. I mean, any more. I mean, I've seen a number of businesses downtown. Uh, when, when I make it there, uh, that take Bitcoin now or take cryptocurrency because you can use it much like, you know, you have your Apple wallet on your phone. You can use it, tap to pay, and they they take it. Um, you know, now, not every business does, but certainly quite a number of them do. Uh, but it's actually very portable, very easy to use. There's no um, challenge with using it in other countries where it's not banned uh, kind of deal because then it's a you know more standardized currency. But, you know, it does require that you have a smartphone, you have an internet connection that you can actually transact business. So, again, you think the, uh, oh, what's the, uh, what's the name of the movie? Like the live free, die hard moment where you have no internet, you have no financial institutions, you can't actually do anything with your money and you have nothing else to show for it um, at the end of the day. So, we, again, we won't go down that fun path, but it is one where it's interesting, but, you know, as I mentioned uh, before, the power is really in the end user's hands. So anybody that owns crypto, it's all on you. If you lose your password to your crypto wallet, you're, for, for lack of a better term, you're screwed. Uh, there are people that have lost millions and hundreds of millions of dollars in Bitcoin uh, because their wallets were, they're obviously encrypted. They lost the password and you only get five attempts at it. You screw it up and you lock it, you're done. There's no way to recover it. So there's a lot of volatility around it, a lot of danger with having it, but you know, obviously you wanna set good passwords around that too. And it does help solve some of those, uh, you know, those real world problems that are out there as well. <clears throat> so, you know, I mentioned before, there's a little bit around, you know, how people get crypto. 
the most common method is mining. Again, it's nothing more than an algorithm. Largely, it's a very complex algorithm. takes a lot of computing power. We won't get into all the detail of it, but you mine it, store it in a blockchain ledger, uh, and then that piece of Bitcoin or whatever piece of crypto becomes yours. And it's immutable at that point. It is yours until you spend it or do something uh, with it. Uh, you know, as I said, most of them are made by mining, but not all have to be. You can buy, you know, there's things called tokens as well, where you can get crypto, a whole bunch of different ways out there. But there are, you know, also a, a number of different ways to spend it. So, you know, I talk about the different kinds of wallets that are out there. There's things called fiat wallets, where you connect it to your bank and where you can convert your crypto into regular currency or vice versa. And there's just a whole bunch of serv other services out there like Coinbase, Crypto.com, um, there's a bunch of them in, in that space, and they all serve kind of different sets, but the, they really help uh, you know, facilitate that process. So the question at the end of the day is, is crypto a good thing or a bad thing for our economy or for the world in general? It, prevents, it presents a lot of opportunity, but there's a lot of risk that comes with it. Does any, anyone have an opinion on that? No, that's a great point. I mean, it's, it's, uh, I guess that's the piece of financial advice, you know, diversify your portfolio for sure. Crypto's, you know, one where you don't want to throw all your eggs in, but is it a bad thing in that case? No. Does it come with risk? Absolutely. Um, but, you know, as, as you think about, you know, bigger, actually, does anybody else have an opinion on that, whether it's good or bad? <laughs> ah, that's the fun conversation. Anything the government gets its fingers into, uh, <laughs> that's that's always always a little bit of fun. And you gotta... Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. That wasn't a point I expected somebody to come up with. I, I like it. You know, it, it is one where I'll say it's, it also has a little bit of a benefit to some pieces, too. I, I um, saw some stuff recently where they were somebody was capitalizing on I'll call it uh, excess uh, natural gas that was coming off from the wells. And they were converting that into energy to run crypto miners. So instead of it just going away, going into the atmosphere and being wasted energy at that point, they were capitalizing on it and getting it for, you know, basically when they did the power calculations, getting it for dirt cheap um, and actually, you know, kind of doing something good with it rather than just letting it go. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure I'm following your question there a little bit. And it could be because I have this mic in my ear too. I'm not catching it. Yeah, I mean, you'll keep, well, again, because it's a finite number, you'll keep having less and less available. So, yeah, I mean, theoretically, that, that could happen. That's where I, you know, I touched on quantum before, which introduces its whole, a whole host of other problems because it's based on, you know, the actual underlying cryptography to make it happen. And quantum kind of busts up everything that we have today. But when you think through the advances that, you know, technology is going through, you know, it will have environmental impacts that are much like, uh, like he said, because you're going to need faster and faster processes to actually make money at it. But when you come into quantum, you know, and there's, there's, there's not a, uh, 
I'll say an actually, you know, demonstrable effect coming as a result of that yet, but it's, I guess all the predictions are like by the end of the decade, we'll have real uses for it. That'll have a big impact, but it'll change how we even do crypto uh, at the end of the day too, because you'll have to have, we call it what post quantum, you know, post quantum uh, cryptography uh, as well. So yes, I think in part it has an environmental impact or will, uh, but there's a, yeah, I don't, Beyond that, I mean, it'd be it'd be pure speculation at that point. But it is an interesting topic um, for sure. Yeah. So what's the what's the entry to market barrier to support this business to go plus one for three? So what what are the kind of the rules of engagement for someone to make up for the market rate? Right. Uh, that yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot of different pieces that have to fit together. And I will admit, I am not fully aware of all of the components uh, for it. But yeah, let's take your example. We want to start a boss coin. You have to, you know, come back and, you know, figure out the cryptographic method that you're going to use. Are you going to, you know, how is that going to be set up? Is it going to be a finite number? Is it going to be unlimited? Uh, and then you have to start showing it. You have to create a little bit of hype around it to actually get it going um, as a key component to it. But it all does come back to, you know, can you demonstrate um, the actual algorithm behind how that coin was set up? Um, you know, that cryptographic method uses, most of the time it uses public key cryptography as a part of it. And then you have to kind of get it introduced into the markets as well. So getting on these different coin platforms, uh, you know, as a part of it as well. That I will say to, is a, probably the extent of my level of depth in how crypto works or how you get it, start a new coin. Um, but it, it is it is possible. Like you said, everybody starts, you know, new coins like Doge and Shiba were just, I'll call it, you know, jokes to start with. And then it kind of took off uh, as a part of that. Absolutely. So, uh, any other comments, questions? No? So now, when we think about, you know, that question of, is crypto a good or a bad thing at the end of the day? Well, while it's inherently, you know, not evil in a sense, it does get used by the bad guys a lot. Um, and it is one where, you know, and just to talk about a couple higher level trends, um, you know, that, that we have, and we'll talk a, a good bit about ransomware today, because that's the easiest case uh, or most common case that it's used for. And I have a couple different stats for you um, to, to talk about here as well. But it, it really comes down to people get hacked, they get their stuff encrypted, and the attacker says, hey, pay me, you know, a thousand Bitcoin. I'm just making numbers up to get the decryption key. And if you don't, then, you know, you don't get any of it back. We just destroyed your business. And it happens a lot more than you'd think. Um, and, you know, we, Booz Allen just recently did a, did a study uh, with uh, Gartner's competitor, Forrester, in this case, um, around basically the to pay or not to pay. So I'll pull, pull in a few things from that here in just a minute as well. But it is interesting when you look at, uh, you know, how crypto has just evolved instead of saying, hey, give me money, which is easily traceable to give me crypto now, give me Bitcoin, because it's much harder to track, not impossible. Uh, the FBI has gotten really good at it, at tracking it down, doing some forensics on the ledgers, seeing where it goes. And I have a little bit of, of some stats to show on kind of where that money goes overall. But, you know, it's also given rise to, you know, the, the prevalence of what they call ransomware as a service at the end of the day. So it's not just people, you know, doing it on their own or having anonymous do it on their own. They're actually selling it as a service now. The bad guys are. They're, they're just as good at, uh, you know, creating a business proposition uh, at the end of the day as well. So, you know, we definitely see, you know, that, that coming along and that prompting some higher regulation. Like um, there's a piece out there right now where, I'm trying to remember if it's actually specific regulation or not, but U.S.-based companies are not supposed to pay ransom in this case because we don't. A lot of it goes to terrorist organizations, uh, and obviously we don't want to support any of that. So there's 
while it's, I'll say it's very strongly worded guidance, you know, there's a number of organizations through some facilitators making payments because there's just no other way to get that information back uh, from, from, you know, from the attackers uh, at all. And it just comes back to the cybersecurity component where they're not as prepared as they should be and doing the right things at the end of the day. No, yeah, it, it makes it, that's why it's very strong guidance not to pay. Now, having said that, they're not coming after companies. Don't quote me on this. Um, they're not coming after companies for paying. And then certainly you have what, you know, what they call exigent circumstances in that case. You know, when you think about, you know, what, a, what the ransomware impact would be on a hospital, you know, is it, hey, we've encrypted all your systems and now you know how, no longer have access to patient data? Or is it, we've encrypted stuff and you can't do things for patients? So it's probably a topic for another discussion where you cross the, uh, you know, the cyber physical bounds a little bit. But when, you know, when lives are at stake, yeah, it's a little different. Um, and ultimately, you know, we end up seeing in situations where time is of the essence. Yeah, they pay, um, which isn't, isn't the best answer for some of that. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd rather see them be prepared up front, have a lot of good backups in place and just, you know, tell the, um, tell the, you know, ransomers to go away <laughs> at the end of the day, but then you risk different things as well. Like people actually just saying, Oh, great here. I'm just going to turn around and sell all that patient data as well, because I already have it. Uh, so a lot of different risks come out of that, but there are quite a number of trends that are, you know, just kind of come into play as a part of that as well. Well, I think I put that one in here because we did actually ask that. Let me flip ahead. Uh, do, 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 just trying to look ahead. Yes, we do. I might have to look it up here. Um, you know, that part of that study was actually looking at, you know, we, we did survey companies that were involved as part of, you know, that had rans had been ransomed um, at some point and looking at it basically it was the study around to pay or not to pay and what the ramifications were. Um, so uh, there is a risk associated with that. The, the, for those that got the decryption key, and I'm trying to remember, you know, how many of them you know, weren't, weren't able to decrypt it. Um, I feel like it was a, a smaller percentage where like most of them, you know, it's a business for these, these attackers and, you know, they, they want to keep getting paid. So it does not behoove them. You know, we'll get into that. Like that's the criminal justice theory coming out for you. Does it behoove them to not decrypt things? You need to get into motive, intent, all that fun stuff, but I think for the most part, uh, they do uh, does usually get decrypted if they, if they pay. But I, I will look that statistic up, and I can't see if it's in there. This is, the slides are this big <laughs> on the little screen. Um, yeah, I, I don't have that in there. But you know, ju just to you know, put it into perspective uh, a little bit as we look at, you know, the, the implication of, you know, crypto on, you know, just cybersecurity as an element, you know, if you, if you needed any other impetus, and I don't have the 2021 numbers, I do know that they are higher than the 2021s. They just, you'd think by now in April, they'd have them released. They do not yet, unfortunately, um, but they have spiked up, you know, with all the pandemic certainly did not help anything <laughs> as it relates to this. So it's, uh, you know, there were lots and lots of organizations that had ransomware attacks, you know, but we'll call it a prominent one like Colonial Pipeline, you know, there's, they were breached. There was some ransom involved there uh, as well to get back into operations. So they're not being shy about who they're going after as a part of it, but, you know, looking at where, where does crypto go? Um, and, and really what's it used for at the end of the day, you know, you start to see, you know, those that are getting crypto and, and, and those different pieces, again, two, two fun eye charts, uh, you know, as, as a part of this, but it breaks down. There's, there's a lot of things where they're paying for, you know, like I said, selling data before they're paying for that with crypto. There's a ransomware element. You'll see kind of a nice uptick. And I actually have a percentage slide next 
um, to talk about in 2020, where you see the ransomware stuff start to spike up as a piece of it. But, you know, it's used as, you know, really to enable, you know, the digital transfer stuff and get around things, you know, a lot of the trackings that government have done for money laundering, different elements, because it facilitates it. It's hard to track, uh, you know, as, as a component to it. You, know, you start to look at some of the edge case components there around, you know, terrorism and domestic extremism doesn't as, usually come as much from ransomware, but that's not to say it's non-existent uh, as a part of it at the end of the day. And, you know, you see just some of the values that that always puts it into really interesting perspective. You know, it's for quite a while there, it was like 400, you know, roughly $400 million dollars. Uh, around there and you know it's not showing any signs of going down so it does have a lot of implications um, around that and, and to show you just a little bit of you know th think of this as this is building on year over year so for 2020 you know the ransomware component was up 311 percent from the previous year so and I know it's even more this year because just based on the number of ransomware calls we've got that's uh, Booz Allen. So it's, it, it is crazy to think that, you know, all and really how crypto is being used. I'll say Bitcoin is the favorite among them because it's got, you know, it's the most established coin. It's the oldest one. It's got the highest level of value associated with it. And barring anything dramatic happening, it'll continue to, to keep that, that value uh, up there. And, and, you know, it's really important to, you know, consider and think that, ransomware really isn't going anywhere at the end of the day they will continue to find new methods so when you think about you know what can we expect from you know the rest of this year the last three quarters of this year and beyond it's really anybody's guess i mean people keep using ransomware it is a viable attack method to come after and really quite frankly extort companies for money and companies still, you know, this is why cybersecurity is a great field to get into. It's great job security. It's only getting harder and only getting better. It's always the you know, cat and mouse game, uh, as I like to say, as a part of it, because companies are just not prepared uh, or not as prepared as they should have been uh, going into this. So, you know, you look at just some of the high level statistics, you know, they're 75% of the companies that we surveyed as a piece of this, and this had uh, this study had about 253 in it, just this segment of it. Three quarters of them weren't prepared um, or not prepared as, as, uh, as, as prepared as they thought they should be. And they didn't know what was going on. So I don't know if you guys have ever seen um, or heard of, there's a framework out there. I use it all the time You know, when I'm having conversations with clients it's called the NIST cybersecurity framework. I'm just going to stay at the function levels. You know, it's identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. You know, th th think about those five key concepts and, you know, put it into perspective. Can we identify the risk? Once we identify a risk, then we can start how bad that risk is and what the potential damage is. Then we can start to make decisions around what do we protect? What do we just want to know, uh, you know, know when it happens? That's the, that's the, the tech stage. And then really have a good response and recovery strategy in place for that. So having all five of those pieces are really critical for all sorts of businesses, or really every business is out there, but lots of them don't spend enough time. You know, if I were to put it into, you know, broad industry perspective for you, you know, as you would expect, financial services is all the way on the left. If you think about how mature a lot of their, their capabilities are, uh, that's largely because they have to be because they're regulated to be. But you start to go down into some of the less mature uh, organizations. Healthcare is a good one. They are not really that good at it, which is scary. Um, that's the fun side part of working in cyber. You get uh, enlightened, I would think, to how scary the world can be at times for you know some of the big name companies that you would expect to have really good security controls. And sometimes they don't. Uh, at the end of the day, but you look at what's the business they're in, what's the type of risk that they're facing, and usually that's a good predictor for how good of a security pro program they're going to have in place, uh, you know, overall as well. But at the end of the day, you know, everybody needs different pieces of security. It's a distributed, much like blockchain, it's a distributed function across the organizations to really build that up uh, and, and move along. Uh, kind of up the curve, if you will, from a maturity perspective. 
So, you know, when we think about how do organizations actually understand or um, kind of address some of these ransomware threats, and, and one of my peers actually came up with uh, the graphic here on, on the right-hand side. I love, love the title for it, the Pyramid of Pain. Um, you know, in, in terms of how do you find different components? So I talked about how important detect is as a part of your environment. Put it in that perspective. How do we know, you know, starting at the bottom, hash values, known attack vector, we know exactly what it looks like, very easy to find, versus you go all the way to the top of the pyramid, this is where you start to think through, how does an attacker actually do it? So that TTP, the tactics, um, well, I'm forgetting what that acronym is, I haven't had, I had to spell it out in a while. Uh, you know, just how do you actually calculate how they're going to do the attack, not what the attack's going to be. That gets much more into, as I said, that criminal justice methodology, as well as actually dissecting, you know, knowing who the kinds of attackers are. You know, and, and it is really interesting when we think about or see some of the nation state attackers, like China, for instance. You know, we know exactly who they are, and we know where they work and when they work. Uh, and they're part of the, you know, not to get into fun geopolitics, but they're part of the Chinese government. They're employed by that, and they do a tax as a part of it. Knowing what and how they do it from a TTP perspective is really critical to defending against that overall as well. And actually using what you learn through this process helps to identify and, and limit potential damages as well as, you know, identify where things can be improved um, across the network as well. Uh, so I won't cover all of these, uh, you know, I want to leave a little bit of time for questions. We're until 1125. Oh, it's 1150, but you can... Oh, okay. No, I can, I could keep going. We'll leave some time for, uh, for questions and answers though, too. And I don't want to keep just talking at you, um, you know, as we go through, but you think through how do we actually, you know, improve the defenses and not need to pay the ransom, uh, going, you know, going forward. It's a whole host of different elements. Um, that come into this, but it's actually thinking through what's the risk we're trying to prevent and then how do we prevent it? Where is that piece of information in our environment? Where is that critical system? Where do we store the patient data? How are they getting access to, you know, some of the, we'll call it the OT side of business or operational technology side where we don't want things to, uh, you know, be encrypted. So how do we stay more prepared against ransomware, you start to think through, well, okay, great, let's actually air gap some of our backups, meaning, you know, we're gonna encrypt them, pull them and send them to Iron Mountain for offsite storage. Because now you can, doesn't matter if your data gets encrypted, you've got a good backup uh, component to it. All sorts of different controls around, you know, preventing how ransomware gets onto and executes in an actual system. So there's those things like multi-factor authentication, you get enhancements on email and endpoints and actually going out and looking for those uh, in in your environment uh, overall as well. And, and, you know, again, as we look through and work with some of our really uh, advanced clients out there, so, so from the, some of the financial institutions where they're mostly at the forefront of capitalizing on blockchain and crypto, a uh, couple different things that come in there because it's not so much for them about the technological control anymore. Their security programs, uh, anytime I, I do like a maturity assessment work with clients, we use a scale from one to five. It's the capability maturity model scale. So one is you're doing it kind of more ad hoc. Five is you're absolutely doing it you know, the best way possible. You completely optimize it. Financial institutions are usually in the four range there. So they're really, really advanced from a technological standpoint. What's missing is actually the communication element. They're very siloed in their thinking. They don't talk very well, which just makes them more vulnerable to a kind of incident here. So if somebody gets compromised, it spreads a lot faster um, in that environment. And, you know, making sure that you have that good uh, call it practice plan that's in place. So you actually know what to do. It's like when, when we all grew up, it's like, well, what happens if somebody gets hurt really bad? You call 911, right? Actually practice it, not practicing calling 911. Not saying that. Uh, <laughs> I have to drill that into my kids because I've already had that happen once. Uh, and it's not fun getting the call back from them. Um, but, uh, you know, actually testing the plan, or I guess the better analogy would be, you know, when, when you were in your parents' house, you know, did you actually have, you know, or talk about 
what happens if the house is on fire? Do you know where to go? Do you know how to get out kind of deal? And actually thinking about that or talking about it and practicing it at times helps kind of burn in a little bit, no pun intended there, that activity uh, for you in your mind. And there's no stranger to doing that uh, for an actual business and an incident response plan, like actually talking through what happens if we actually do get attacked? What happens if all of our client data gets encrypted? Are we going to pay? Are we not going to pay? Uh, it, it, the part of that study was actually looking at who's the ultimate decision owner for when we're going to pay or not. A lot of times it actually goes all the way up to the CEO uh, to make that final call. A um, lot of mechanics that go into the background for actually making that decision and actually ha having it you know, kind of happen at the end of the day. But uh, it go usually goes all the way to the top. But you know, having all of that activity really, you know, thought out practice, actually, you know, while you have to, it's kind of like the adage, you have to spend money to make money, you kind of got to spend money to save a little money at the end of the day, um, as well, and actually communicating the activities that you're doing, you know, to the board, having the board do, we call them tabletop exercises, where it's actually running through these scenarios. Um, you know, part of my whole team is built on doing tabletops actually practicing this stuff out injecting sometimes some real world stuff like we can using some of our other teams we we have them encrypt pieces safe pieces but say hey great here this is encrypted here we want we want this demand now go uh, you know we want this this amount of bitcoin go what would you do how would you respond and just facilitate that that thought process it, it gets to be very enlightening you know at the end of the day and, and really helpful for organizations um and kind of fun to do because you get different reactions uh, from different personalities um, as well. So, you know, all, almost done. And I want to look up those stats you asked about um, as well. But, you know, when you think about just some things to keep in mind, you know, for the future, you know, I mentioned, you know, security is everybody's responsibility. You know, as, as you, you know, this is a, you know, senior level class um, or 400 level class, you know, you're, you're going to be out in the workforce here pretty soon. Uh, as well. So making sure that people are aware of the risk and aware of the complicated, you know, the things that have to come in from cybersecurity is critically important uh, for that. You know, that's uh, when I talk to boards, I, I love trying to use analogies with them, as you've probably noticed, I use a few of them uh, all the time. But just kind of illustrating the point, like when you leave your house in the morning, you leave your apartment or your dorm room, do you lock the door or do you call the police to lock your door? So you do it, right? Because you understand it's it's your responsibility. Same thing goes for cybersecurity. It's everybody's responsibility to protect yourself, protect your own information. Uh, you know, and, and kind of shifting gears a little bit as we think about what organizations need to do and need to continue uh, to do as a part of it. You know, certainly with the I'll call it massive adoption of cloud, uh, cloud resources day, the massive shift to cloud, integrating security control, security testing activities into that whole process is absolutely critical. So getting it integrated um, with the tech stack, whether it's on-premise or whether it's in the cloud or in the multi-cloud environment, you know, is just crucial as a part of it as well. And, you know, as we look towards the future around, you know, where a breach is gonna focus, um, there's ransomware, as I said before, is never going away. But now as more and more businesses are starting to accept crypto or are using crypto um, or mining it in some cases, you know, you'll start to see a little bit more of an expansion around actually trying to steal it. Um, you know, you, you have a password to get into your crypto wallet now. Be no different for, you know, for institutions as well. So setting up some of the two factors or two person operations are just ways to think about, uh, you know, trying to protect some of that information. Um, you know, in, in the last couple here, you know, we, we touched on ransomware as a service before, but I can already tell you it's very lucrative for folks. Don't go getting any ideas, but it is very lucrative uh, for the threat actors that are out there, you know, and basically selling their services because they can buy access a lot of times uh, to organizations, buy passwords, you can buy, a whole lot of crap on the uh, on the dark web um, for sometimes pretty cheap. Uh, like a social security number used to be pretty expensive. It's not anymore. Uh, it's really, really easy to get out there. And, uh, you know, just thinking about, you know, how 
nation states are going to continue uh, to expand and increase their attack portfolios and, and the targets that they're going after, we're only going to see a rise in that because it's just their modus operandi uh, for, for operating in there as well. So, you know, just quickly in closing, and then I want to take uh, take questions if you guys have them or you know, to other topics that we want to chat about. You know, one critical thing that I, I stress with kind of every organization that I talk to, it's like there is no such thing as perfect protection out there. Does not matter how much money they spend, how prepared they think they are. All it takes is one chink in your armor and you're vulnerable and somebody can capitalize on that. So cybersecurity is an endless cycle, if you will. Great career field to get into. Not trying to talk that piece up, but it is fun. Uh, at, at the same time, you get to see some really challenging problems and help clients, uh, you know, particularly when I, you know, you do consulting like me, kind of work through some of those problems as well, or if you go into industry, actually solve some of them as well. So thanks, everyone. Any other questions, comments, topics we want to get into? And I'll look up your stat while we're, while we're chatting here, too. You mean our own internal stuff or what, what we do with clients? Um, uh, uh, yes, there's some sharing between the two, like what we're doing. Um, in terms of answering, I think your underlying question, every day, it changes. Um, that That's just the nature. I get to use this one. Back when I was in school, cybersecurity moved a little slower than it does today. You know, that that's just aligned to the, I'll uh, call it the technological innovation curve. I mean, I'm sure you guys have been shown that at some point or another, but it's an exponential chart, if you will, where it's just massively increasing. And that increases the amount of uh, amount of change that pertains to cybersecurity. So, you know, particularly from working with our clients, yes, it's very rapid changing. Internally, we have to adapt. I mean, Booz Allen is a massive defense contractor uh, as well. I, I work in the commercial part of the business, meaning I work with only commercially oriented organizations, not government entities. And uh, some of the problems are the same. Some of them are massively different. Uh, so the approach is that we take, you know, very quite extensively, even within our, the business units that we have within, uh, within Booz Allen as well. So that's my consulting answer. It depends on the situation, um, but it, it's quite adaptive and quite rapid. Where does the money go? Yeah. We have some of that data. There's also a number of other companies out there. I think um, I should have cited all my sources in this to be the responsible person. Uh, Chain Analysis is another company out there that puts out a bunch of this information. Some of it's easily publicly available out there uh, as well. But yeah, I mean, it's it's massively tracked. The FBI tracks an extensive amount of that, um, as do many of the mo major you know security companies out there as well. So yeah, it, that that data in particular is a mix. Of a couple different sources, um, you know, to really, to really illustrate that. But Uh, they're, they're actually, you know, as, as I was trying to prep for this, I did come across some really good stuff. There was a, a kind of a case study, if you will, for, for the FBI and finding the money kind of deal. They, 
Bitcoin. I think there were like 70 Bitcoin, if I'm trying to, I'm trying to recall this, that were transferred to pay a ransom. They found 52 of them, tracked them all the way down. Uh, and the piece that they couldn't was actually the, like the 15% or whatever odd percent it is that went to the actual attacker group themselves. The rest of it was all domestic here in the U.S. Um, and But yeah, they're, they're getting pretty good at, at tracking down where some of that money goes, much like they do with money laundering, um, you know, to, to a good extent. Now, it could be them just touting a really good case study in that case where we don't, there's a lot of money, we don't know where it goes. Um, but, you know, as you, uh, t I think the other question you were asking was, you know, is, are people getting better at cyber? Um, maybe, I mean, that's certainly my hope that people are becoming more cyber aware, but at the same time, they change their perspective. So you look at like the scam spike there, you'd have to dig into why, you know, what kinds of scams were they that people were getting into and were being affected by, um, you know, there's a whole element or or you know i'll call it um discipline of what's called social engineering like knowing how to target people um and target them very very well to make it believable and then have them kind of act on it uh some of that goes into like actually the people building those those scams building and enacting them um you know at the end of the day i'm just trying to look up the any other questions i'm trying to look up this statistic no. uh, I'm not sure I follow you so you're, you're saying pro mm, that is a good one that it's a level of detail that I don't have off the top of my head for that one so I apologize for that I would have to look that up if we can make this. So th this was to answer your earlier question on, you know, we we got the we got the key. Did it actually work? Um, kind of deal. So for the most part, it did uh, to some degree. I mean, you see what eighty four percent of the time they at least got some of the data back. Um, I think it, I think it's a mix. I think some of it has to do. Uh, we didn't ask that level of a question as a part of it. Um, it could be, hey, we just depending, you know, call it the, you know, introduce a little relativity here in terms of the data itself. You know, if, if it takes you a week to get it back, is it still good or not? You know, are there are a lot of things like, were you still transacting business? Does that change what you're doing and the, and the validity or integrity of that data? It could. Some cases, yeah, they could just go in and mess with it a little bit, or they could have wrote some other code in the actual encryption algorithm for the ransomware that transposed digits. And think about a major financial ledger that got encrypted. If you just start going through and randomly doing that, how hard would it be to go back? Luke? Anything else? Yeah, hey, Pam. Luke, this is Pam. Um, there's a question in the chat. If you can't see it, I can read it to you. Um, let me look it up here quick. So sorry, Pam, the, Pam's talking in my ear here. We're just trying to make sure. Uh, let me see if I can make this work. Okay. Oh, there it is. I will look in the chat right now. Do you see the topic of blockchain being used a lot more in the banking industry? Uh, so the short answer to that is yes. Uh, but it's not limited uh, to just uh, the banking industry. That was like going back to, um, let's see if I can pull this other deck up here. Uh, go, going back to the potential use cases that you have uh, uh, for, for crypto, uh, for blockchain rather, you know, the possibilities are kind of endless. The, the most financial institutions are usually the ones that, um, you know, kind of get ahead uh, a bit. And I realize I'm not sharing the screen with you right now. Um, share that so you can see it. Try to do that on the fly a little bit. Um, you know, you look, look at all uh, kind of around the circle here. There's definitely financial services there, but blockchain really enables 
so many different things um like banking's all the way up here in this uh upper right hand corner um and you'll see a couple examples just associated with that but you kind of go all the way around that circle it's everywhere um and it will just continue to, to be everywhere as well so hopefully that answered your question Oh, yeah, sorry, go ahead. When it first started, it was more common, less so now. I mean, when you, when, that, this is where, you know, size, complexity, and, and scale come into play and really what was encrypted at the end of the day, you know, particularly for ransomware in that case, that plays a major part in, you know, business recoverability. But yeah, absolutely. It does still happen occasionally. I don't have any examples off the top of my head for you uh, for that, but it's less common now than it used to be. Uh, there's definitely cases like that. Uh, I mean, it's, you'll see the, I'll use my consulting answer first. It depends. Um, you do see part of it's related to who the attackers are. You know, to, to your point, it could be ransomware as a service where they're just doing a lot of these and, you know, hey, we'll send out a hundred of them, do it to a hundred companies because we've got, you know, they've got this vulnerability in their service and we're going to get in and, and encrypt a bunch of stuff, counting on that maybe only five of them do it or maybe 10 of them do it and just collect that cash and run uh, kind of deal. But when it's more targeted, then the numbers are a little higher. They're usually in the, the couple million dollar range. I haven't seen, uh, at least not recently, any that are exorbitantly high, like, hey, pay me $100 million. That I haven't seen lately. That's not to say it doesn't happen. Uh, because the, the interesting part, a lot of times when people get you know ransomed, they're not going public about it unless they have to. Uh, so there's a lot of things that happen, obviously, behind the curtains uh, where we, like we, even for all the companies we support, we don't always get to see that kind of information either. So it, it's a, you know, up and down kind of bit for, for that. But I mean, we do see that and a lot of times they're ba they're banking on the fact that it's like, oh, well, it's only 20 grand. Uh, you know, it's like I spent more on toilet paper for that for the last year for a hot to like to run a hospital kind of deal. Um, so. Comments, questions, other topics? Was this helpful? Yeah? Man, silent classroom today. Do, did we get any more in the chat? No, we did not. All righty. I mean, if there's nothing else, I mean, I'll let you guys go, uh, you know, 10 minutes early, you know, <laughs> if David will house. But thank you all for, uh, for your attention today. Uh, certainly, you know, Always fun when I get to come back and do this. I don't even live that far from campus and uh, I don't make it back here a whole lot, but uh, it's nice when I do.